I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. So I was having a conversation with Brian Keating, who uh, wrote the book Losing the Nobel Prize. He's a prominent physicist. He's trying to win the Nobel Prize and trying to prove how the Big Bang occurred. And it's very innovative. We discussed it a little on the podcast you're about to listen to. But before the podcast started, we were having a conversation, as I often do with many of my guests. And he was telling me about a guy who won the Physics Nobel Prize in 2017, Barry Barish, who uh, admitted to Brian that he felt imposter syndrome, even after winning the Nobel Prize. And imposter syndrome is that feeling you get when you feel like, oh, I don't belong here. Everyone's better than me, smarter than me. I just got lucky or whatever. I was surprised. How does a Nobel Prize winner like, experience imposter syndrome? Like, is that what caused his success maybe? Or how does he get over it? Or what? Something feels to me like it's useful to know more about why because I feel imposter syndrome often, I'm sure many of you do, and sometimes it could be a very good thing. And so I wanted to explore this. What does it mean to have imposter syndrome even when you're acknowledged as one of the highest ranking geniuses in history of your field? What is going on here psychologically or what is this, how is this related? Perhaps this is related to his peak performance. And so I also wanna mention, this is gonna be the first episode of several with Brian, again, a notable physicist, wrote the book Losing the Nobel Prize. We're gonna do a series, starting with this one, basically on all the theories of how the universe began. So we'll talk about multiverses and the Big Bang and string theory and other dimensions and what are the theories? How do you prove how the universe began? And some of the theories are really amazing, like maybe we're all in a simulation and we talk about whether that can be proven or not, and so on. So this begins a series of episodes about this. I'd be curious as to your thoughts, and it's very fun, a lot of educational stuff. I am a novice at all of this. I did a lot of research. I'm asking the questions and trying to figure this out myself from Brian, who is an, an expert, and he's able to explain in, in layman's terms. So it was very interesting and valuable if you're at all interested in understanding how did the whole thing start? And we cover every single theory. Another thing is I divided this particular episode about Nobel Prizes and imposter syndrome up into two episodes, but they're both released today. Download both of them. You can listen to them one after the other, or you can listen to the first one today and the second one tomorrow. But both episodes uploaded today, I just divided it into two to make it a little bit more manageable to keep track of. Anyway, Nobel Prizes, imposter syndrome, off we go. So Brian Keating, physicist extraordinaire, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, James. It's been a pleasure. I hope you had a good uh, Thanksgiving break. Uh, eh, not really. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't like sitting around waiting for food to be eaten. And also, 
Who eats turkey? You can't go to a restaurant and order turkey because turkey sucks, right? Like it's not good food. Why do they eat it on Thanksgiving? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can't go and get a, you know, a, a barbecue turkey a sandwich either. That's true. What five-star restaurant on the planet serves turkey? Any? There are some like uh, Jewish, you know, like kind of kosher restaurants. Not that they serve turkey, but you can go in there and get a kugel. You know, it's like nobody orders kugel at any other restaurant in the world. And it, it, it should be, you know, it should be more popular than it is. But yes, Which is right. a shame because, yes, that is like the best dessert kind of food in the world. But turkey bacon is for basically people who don't want to eat red meat. Like, what, yep. what's wrong with them? And they think turkey's healthier. But, uh, oh, no, okay. Oh, turkey bacon's also a Jewish thing because uh, bacon's kosher, uh, not kosher. But that's it. And, and turkey bacon sucks compared to bacon. Right. You wouldn't know this because you're kosher. That's but right. I could tell you it's a 10x difference between bacon and turkey. <laughs> There's no comparison. And you're not healthier eating turkey bacon. So no. that's the only excuse to eat. So anyway, I didn't really enjoy it that much. How was yours? <laughs> uh, we had a good locksgiving. We were locked down. Uh, and we had a very small crowd. But yeah, I, I like eating at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock p.m. I mean, that's kind of, you know, I like to have the meal between brunch and dinner. I like to squeeze that one in uh, because, you know, I've been battling a food allergy for a long time. I don't know if you knew that. No. I have a, a horrible food allergy. I'm allergic to stopping eating. <laughs> and when that occurs, I get hangry. Uh, yeah. No, it was good. It was good. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're still locked down here in Southern California. They lumped us together with Los Angeles. So first they steal the San Diego Chargers. Then they lump us together with Los Angeles so that our ICU capacity is off the charts. Thanks, L.A., and I just, like, if they want to encourage more enmity between San Diego and the great smogopolis to the north, they couldn't have designed a better way than locking us down together. I know. that's uh, Now, are you getting a lot of cases? Is that why they're locking things down? I mean, there's definitely cases are going up. Uh, it depends on, you know, the different approaches. You know, some schools are open. My university's open. But it's like, it's open if you want to come to campus. And then everyone's like, well, who wants to come to campus? But, you know, there are people here, and, and it's about one-third capacity. Actually, San Diego is thriving. Of all the UC campuses, my chancellor tells me that we are the best financially. We have record attendance, record enrollment. So people aren't listening to the advice that you gave so sagely to not go to college. I know. Not, not go to college and not owning a home would have really helped people a lot in this pandemic situation. And because uh, everybody's really nervous who owns a home. I think that was a lot of the... Well, anyway, you were just mentioning to me before we started the podcast that a Nobel Prize winner you were talking to was experiencing imposter syndrome. And he's got... This always amazes me that basically nobody is ever happy no matter what. Like, and I'm not saying he's unhappy. Like, I'm not making fun of him. This is true for, for everybody, that everybody feels like, I don't know what it is, that they either want more, that they haven't achieved as much, or that they've done something disappointing, they have fear. So here's someone you're saying who won the Nobel Prize. In other words, a committee of his peers said this is the best guy on the planet for what he does, or at least top 50 in history for what he does or she does, because I don't. we haven't talked about who it is. He still feels imposter syndrome. Are you able to say who it is? Or Yeah, yeah, I know. I'll say, I mean, it's on my podcast. So I do the Into the Impossible podcast. Where I talk to a multiverse of mind maniacs who are just uh, the most brilliant people on earth, uh, as well as ordinary people that, you know, you've been a guest three times on my show and you're, you haven't yet won a Nobel Prize, but maybe skip the line will get you the coveted Nobel Prize in literature. Um, and so I interview these people and it's amazing. You know, I'm like, thank you, COVID. No, don't, don't hate me for this. But I couldn't have started this podcast probably without COVID. These book tours are canceled. People are going you know, kind of stir crazy at home and they like to talk to somebody who cares deeply about their work. And the one thing I pride myself on is researching very deeply, reading all the books that these people have written, every single thing I can consume so I can ask them questions that they've never been asked before. Not like, how did it feel to win a Nobel Prize? Except this time I did. I kind of uh, slipped for a second and I said, you know, I have these patented three questions that I ask all my guests at the end of the show. One of which is what seemed impossible to you in the past, but because you had the courage to go into the impossible, which is the title of the podcast, that makes sense to you and kind of advice to your former self. So that's kind of one of my things. And I asked this of the Nobel laureate, Barry Barish, who won the 2017 Nobel Prize for the detection of waves of gravity emanating from the coalescence of two black holes, each one the mass of 30 suns colliding together at 99.9% .9 the speed of light. So, so let me ask you about what that means. So yeah. two black holes that are out there mm -hmm. in space 
collapsed into each other and it created some sort of event and some weird kind of black hole explosion, whatever happens, and re released, because there's so much gravity in a black hole, the collision released gravitational waves and he was able to build something that detected it or? Yeah, so anytime you have uh, something that has mass and something that is accelerating back and forth or orbiting or something like that, it loses some bit of its energy in the forms of not waves of light, like our sun is giving off waves of light, but it's also giving off tiny waves of gravity. The more the mass of the object and the faster it's accelerating, the more gravitational wave energy will be produced. So actually, when you're driving down the Florida Turnpike, as I know you do often, uh, and you're shaking your hand back and forth like this at the other drivers, like a good New Yorker or ex-New Yorker fleeing the corpse of that great once fair city, and as I'm you in do, New York City right now, but go uh, ahead. Oh, you are? Okay, yes. awesome. So you're going down Fifth Avenue, and you're shaking your fist back and forth. Get out of my way, you uber maniac. You're actually generating a tiny bit of gravitational waves. You'd generate more if you had Terminator-like biceps like I do, but <laughs> you generate gravitational waves. And that causes energy to be lost from your body. Now, most of the energy is in the heat that your body is generating and muscle energy and so forth. But in this case, they realized that Einstein predicted the existence of waves of gravity, which could come forth any collision in the universe. But the more matter, the more energy, and the more brief the collision occurs over, the vaster the amount of energy dissipated in the form of gravitational waves there will be. Why, when there's explosion, is there, are there more gravitational waves released? Because anything of the, the amount of gravitational wave power, power is energy per unit time. So the more energy, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. So the more mass means more energy. And then divided by time, the shorter the time interval over which the energy is, is dissipated, the greater the amount of gravitational wave power will be emitted. This exactly is the same as a charge in motion, electronic charge, just like an electron, orbiting around uh, a something heavier or making quantum jumps in an atomic structure. That produces a wave of electromagnetic radiation. So Einstein realized that the laws of gravity, the equations that govern gravity, are exactly the same in form as the waves that are generated by electromagnetic charges in motion. Therefore, gravity can produce waves. And those waves travel at, guess what speed these waves travel at? Speed of light. Speed of light. Because light is a form of electromagnetic wave, but it's also gravitational. Anything that has no mass, like a photon, and we think like a graviton, can travel only at the speed of light. And these are kind of the main players that gave me the idea to create bicep. Because where would you have even more mass than two giant black holes and, two, and more than two giant galaxies? Well, all the mass in the universe, and remember how short the time interval was, for my TEDx talk that you and I shared, uh, that the amount of acceleration took place over a time period 10 to the minus 36th of a second. In other words, a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. That energy was all dissipated from all the matter in the universe. So that would have produced a tremendous amount of gravitational waves if the universe originated in this inflationary expansion. And right now, when we see the, you know, the static on the TV, when we see this cosmic microwave background radiation, that's this plasma that exists 300,000 years after the creation of the universe. We have seen and detected that, but we can't see beyond that because the plasma is so tight. We can't really see uh, to the begin three hundred just 300,000 years earlier to the, the Big Bang. But your theory was, hey, gravitational waves can pass through this plasma. So if we can detect gravitational waves, we'll be able to see, quote unquote, see the Big Bang. And that's what your bicep telescope was supposed to do. Yeah, exactly. Instead of looking at exposing light and making a photograph of light, I realized we could make a photograph with gravity and waves of gravity would should act the same way again, if and only if inflation took place. So this was a key test that is really the cornerstone of this approach for my career to look back as far as we can, not looking with light, but looking with gravity. Because gravity goes through everything. Gravity goes through the earth. That's how you can have a tide, high tide in New York, and I can have a low tide in California, and then eight hours later have a high tide. So the gravity of the moon is going all the way through the earth, and it's coming out the other side because gravity cannot be stopped. So when I'm feeling the effects of gravity, like when I jump up and then fall down, it's because the core of the earth is sending out gravitons that are essentially pulling me down. I'm getting hit by gravitons and so that means gravity is affecting me and pulling me down to 
the heavier source. Yeah, you're exchanging gravitons. But, uh, you know, our friend, mutual friend, Eric Weinstein, If well, first of all, we don't know if gravitons exist. And actually, for the, the type of process you just described, we don't need quantum mechanical particles of gravity, which are what gravitons are. Gravitons are so-called particles of gravity, which would represent a quantization of gravity, a so-called theory of everything, which has been a huge topic lately on my podcast and with some of the greatest minds in the world, including Eric Weinstein and Stephen Wolfram and other people. And that's become kind of a core skew. So that's one of my skews is-, is A trope. A, a trope, yeah, is uh, theories of everything. But my claim lately, which has been not refuted by any of my guests, is that um, we don't actually know if gravity is quantized because the only two instances in which gravity being quantized could be manifest is at the beginning of time, if the universe began in a so-called singularity, or at the core of a black hole, which is called a singularity or beyond the event horizon. But neither one of those two things is ever possible to reveal. In other words, we can't see to the core of a black hole, and we can't see back to the beginning of time. And so both of these cases, we are hearing claims from Brian Greene and Michio Kaku and all sorts of other uh, theorists that we need this theory of gravity to be quantized. I say, I see no mandate from, there's no letter from God that says you have to quantize gravity. So it may not be that we need gravitons, although that is slightly a detour from your original question. When you jump into the air, actually you're weightless. You're not feeling anything. You don't feel any acceleration when you're, when you're in the air at all. You eventually get pulled down. You don't realize it. You are being accelerated by the earth, but you could be in free fall forever and not notice it. And that Einstein called his greatest, most delightful realization when he had that notion that basically gravity is non-existent in free fall. We take that for granted. But eventually you'll hit the ground. And when you hit the ground, you'll undergo a huge deceleration. And at that point, you will give off waves of gravity. Of course, that's dwarfed by waves of gravity from the Earth going around the sun, which is much more massive and traveling much faster than you as well. And this is a, a tangent to this guy's imposter syndrome, but yeah. I'm just trying to understand the, the scope. But it's also interesting for, for many reasons. For a couple of questions. A, a black hole doesn't emit light, right? That's why it's a black hole because even the light is, it, the gravity is so great. The light, nothing can leave a black hole except for a small amount of this so-called Hawking radiation that Stephen Hawking- um, That's right. Came up with the idea of. But gravity obviously leaves a black hole, but does it share any properties of how electromagnetic radiation yeah. doesn't leave a black hole? Yeah, so if you remember like the bunny ears on your television, that's like uh, these pieces of metal. Metal has a lot of electrons in them. And when an electromagnetic wave from the TV station or radio station comes in and hits the metal and the electrons in the metal feel, experience a gravitational force, an electromagnetic force field that causes them to go up and down very close to the speed of light at a certain frequency. That frequency then induces a tiny current at exactly the same frequency that's being broadcast. So in other words, you can make an antenna using the same principles, but make a gravitational antenna one that you would then amplify the signal of. And effectively, that's what this guy, Barry Barish, with his colleagues, did. And they built a gravitational wave antenna or a gravitational wave observatory. And anytime there's any uh, substance that's leaving the black hole, it could be neutrinos, it's not coming from the singularity. It can't be coming from within what's called the event horizon, which is the point of no return. So nothing happens to you if you were to fall into a black hole. I had Jan Levin on. She's a, an amazing uh, physicist at Barnard College. And she uh, was describing her new book. It's called Black Hole Survival Guide. And it talks about how- I love that title. Yeah, it's a really cool title. She's a wonderful uh, human being too. Uh, she, she won a MacArthur Prize. She runs this thing called Pioneer Works in Brooklyn. Actually, I, I actually uh, tried to connect her you two over the summer and I'll do it again because she'd make an amazing guest for you. Jennifer uh, Eleven. I love Jana, that name too. Jana, J-A-N-N-A. That's like a, a robot name. Jan, yeah. uh, my name is Jenna Eleven. <laughs> Jenna like totally Eleven. A, totally a science fiction name. <laughs> she is, yeah. Uh, she's human size. She's like five foot zero. And she's like the most brilliant powerhouse there is in astrophysics. She and was she's like a world champion at sword fighting and lives in District 11. 
I don't know. I'm coming up with a novel now. She lives beyond Thunderdome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So she uh, describes in her book, and nothing happens to you. You won't even notice it, but it'll be too late for you to do anything about it. Once you get past the event horizon, no one will be able to see what happens to you later on. And eventually you'll end up in the black hole singularity, but there's nothing you can do about it. And there's nothing anyone outside of the so-called event horizon can do, but you won't get stretched into spaghetti. You won't get exploded for a very long time. It could take years before that would happen. Well, also as you're speeding up towards the singularity, you're starting to go closer and closer to the speed of light. So time has to slow down for you, right? Well, time slows down for you compared to another observer inside the event horizon that could still see you. But but even if you were to accelerate right now in your millennial falcon to 99% the speed of light, you would experience no aging. Your your heart would beat, you'd, you'd live to 120. Nothing else would change. It wouldn't be like, oh, I lived to 1,500 years old. Uh, you would keep aging. And, and we would see you as coming back very young because we would age and you wouldn't. But that's right. all. That's the relativity aspect of gravitational force fields. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. It's not released from within the black hole. It's just the explosion itself outside the two black holes exploding releases a bunch of gravitational energy, just like it releases electromagnetic energy. And this guy, Barry Barish, you said, uh, mm -hmm. he used an antenna to detect it. And so when there was a, a black hole that occurred in the sky, or the, the explosion occurred in the sky, he saw probably an uptick his antenna registered it. Yeah, there were two antennas. There are two antennas. One is in Washington State and one's in Louisiana. And they saw the gravitational wave signal in each one of these kind of ripple their detector like Jurassic Park, you know. Uh -huh. But if it just happened in one of them, you could say, oh, there's some guys outside shooting at alligators in Louisiana, which does happen to their detectors. They can register. Sometimes these alligator hunters shoot the, the observatory tubes. They're four kilometers long, you know, almost uh, over two miles long. Uh, and so uh, they, get, they get, you know, shotgun blasts that hit their detector sometimes. But that doesn't happen in Washington State. That's a thousand miles away or more. So the fact that they saw the exact same signal pattern, which has a unique signature, and they saw it delayed by the light travel time that it would take a beam of light to travel from Washington State to Louisiana. So measured in nanoseconds. Measured in, and this is, I think, in milliseconds, yep. Mm -hmm. And light can't do that, right? So if it was an explosion, light would take the, the path that would go around the surface of the Earth. This signal went through the Earth. It didn't. The Earth didn't exist for it, in a sense. Because what happened was, that effectively, if you were sitting on a scale, first you'd feel your weight would go up, you know, by the weight of an electron or something like that. It would appear as if your weight went up a tiny bit in Washington State. And then six milliseconds later, uh, your weight would go down. And in Louisiana, your weight would go up, and then it would go down. Exactly in that pattern that's anticipated by the uh, theory of general relativity. So so what's amazing about this? Like why, because, okay, we're discussing this. All right, it makes sense. And I believe it without having, and okay, you can make an antenna that detects it. What's, what's so amazing that put him in the over the top for the Nobel Prize? Well, it's kind of like Galileo. Like people had a telescope, people knew about light, uh, but then he looked at Jupiter and saw, hey, Jupiter's got these moons that go around it. I mean, that, okay, didn't immediately lead to new technology? Not necessarily, and nor do I think you should only do science that leads to technology. But we, for the first time, changed the entire paradigm of how the universe was structured. Before that, it was centered on the Earth. After Galileo, it was centered on the sun. So it's like asking, well, is Galileo's optical telescope, is that only useful for looking at moons of Jupiter? No, we know all the Hubble discoveries, all the CMB discoveries that my team and, and colleagues have made. And so, too... This has now opened up a whole new range of exploration because it doesn't only see black holes. It sees all sorts of effects, including things called neutron stars. It sees supernovae. It sees all sorts, and it's going to get more and more sensitive over time. We're just at the beginning. It's like 1611 in astronomy. So, so would you say this is eventually going to do what you were trying to do with Bicep? Like, will he be able to see beyond the plasma of the cosmic background radiation and see the Big Bang? He won't with this type of technology. In principle, in theory, it could. This exact same type of technology could see it. But the problem is the Earth has certain background that it produces in the form of vibration. The Earth is continually vibrating. And over, this is pretty interesting. He pointed this out to me. The Earth vibrates at about like eight hertz or five hertz. And Jay will know this, that the human ear can't pick up anything until about what, Jay, 20 hertz? Uh, so it's 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. 
Yeah, so we can't hear it, James. But if you could hear, if the human ear hadn't evolved as a filter, you know, I joke with my wife, I was born with a filter that filters out infants crying at three in the morning. I, I, it doesn't work to <laughs> that's anybody an amazing, else. That's like a mutant power. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You're an X man. But if I didn't, I would be driven crazy. And if we hadn't evolved as human beings to filter out this frequency, that's part of the reason we hear from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, as Jay was just saying. That is because the earth is vibrating at this frequency. So the reason that we can't hear very low bass notes the way a whale can or whatever, what is a whale? Is the whale on earth? No, the whale is in the water, right? So the water doesn't vibrate at that same frequency. So it can do those very low tones. And so by because of the fact that the earth has this fundamental, like a gong is vibrating, it would drive us crazy if we actually could hear it. But they can hear it. They can hear anything. And unfortunately, the earth vibrates way too much to see the very, very longest wavelength gravitational waves, which are low frequency, that we can see with the cosmic background radiation. We're effectively taking LIGO and putting it back to 380,000 years after the Big Bang. In other words, we're using the universe, this plasma, as a type of LIGO, as a type of gravitational wave antenna. But we're putting it closer to the explosion itself. We're isolating it from local sources of vibration. And we're using it to take a picture of the universe as seen with gravitational waves. If they exist, I have to keep adding that because we don't know if they exist. Now, now you're on bicep two already or bicep three. I, I forget, you know, and we've talked about this before, but why, again, have you not yet detected? You're, you're all set up. It's all in the South Pole. You've been in the South Pole. You've got all the telescopes working. Why haven't you been able to detect the Big Bang gravitational waves through the, you know, coming through the cosmic background radiation? I can make a glib comment that we're only a quarter of the way in terms of time that it took LIGO to win its Nobel Prize. And we're only 1% or 2% of LIGO's budget. LIGO's over a billion dollars. Wow. And 40 years worth of, of experimentalists around the world. And you know, it's so interesting. I, we're taking so many side tours, but it's just going to take more time. If, again, I have to keep stressing this, we don't know if inflation took place. And that's part of our series on uh, ways the Big Bang could have occurred but didn't. But right. we don't know it occurred. We don't know if it occurred, what kind of energies were involved. Remember, the amount of gravitational wave energy power that we detect depends on how much energy. And that depends on how much energy the inflaton, this vacuum energy, had stored up within it at the earliest times in the universe's history, a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the origin of the universe, if it had an origin. But again... We're talking about ways the universe could evade having a single origin. So it's either going to take time or it's never going to happen. And the problem that I had last time is I was in such a rush to make it happen while I'm alive. And, and it's understandable, given how long these things, scientific projects take, uh, that we didn't make a discovery that we thought we were trying to do because we wanted to see the signal so badly, in my case at least. And in my case also, I was overwhelmed by at least the concept of winning a Nobel Prize. So what's so interesting about this project is the more you more data you take, the better your signal detection capability gets. However, if you in, if you take data for four years as compared to two years, or if you take uh, data for eight years instead of two years, you only increase your sensitivity not by a factor of four, but by a factor of two. So you only win over time and get more and more sensitive as the square root of time. So to get twice as sensitive, you need to integrate or take data for four times as long. Eventually, that gets up to like tens and tens of years, and it's just never going to happen. With LIGO, they really just barely made this detection that led to their Nobel Prize. So the reason I went down this line of questioning is I'm putting together a portrait for myself of why he might feel like an imposter. So I have an idea, but I want to address another thing you said, which is about how Michio Keiko and Brian Green insist that, you know, gravitational waves should also turn into gravitons, should be quantized, as you put it, the same way light waves can be viewed as photons. My guess is, is because they're both string theorists, right? And so given that, as we've talked about in another, in an earlier podcast, given that gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves are different, but exhibit many of the same properties, like they both go the speed of light. I forget how you referred it, but they both, like you just mentioned, they lose significance by, uh, uh, you know, at the square root of the distance or whatever. Um, so they, they seem like the same, but somehow different that maybe in some other way of viewing a spectrum of waves, not the electromagnetic spectrum, but maybe, maybe there's another uh, way of viewing a spectrum of waves. There may be the same thing, but just on different wavelengths in this alternative way of viewing waves. Like some people have discussed that gravitational waves are emanating from other universes in a multiverse situation. 
So my guess is they, since all this stuff breaks down into these multi-dimensional strings, according to Michio Keiko and Brian Green, that that's why they figure it, they must be the same thing and they must break down the strings. So they must have the same properties. Yeah, the problem is that there's absolutely no evidence for it. So I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Why? I don't know if you saw this meme going around today. I, I think you did because you you hearted or liked my my tweet about it. But there's this meme going around like, imagine a world run by scientists. And it was Michio Kaku. It was Lawrence Krauss, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And they're all physicists and astronomers. And uh, and I'm like, uh, okay. So I tweeted out, like, imagine a world. Yeah. And I, all, all of them were women. <laughs> my, my PC cred went off the charts. Uh, but but the point is, is, is that all these people were theorists. And theorists, it's very different to do theoretical science versus experimental science. I've had on people lately, I'm not going to mention names, that are really at the top of their, you know, field. No one, you know, at the level of a Brian Greene or a Michio Kaku. They're all theorists. And the issue is, I've never heard of someone retracting a theory. Have you? Have you ever heard someone say like, oh, you know, my theory is wrong. Uh, but, you know, even even the guys who preferred the steady state theory that we talked about earlier in the series, um, even they, they went to their grave believing in the steady state model. They just had to tweak it and add cycles to it and make it quasi steady state. And these are some of the most eminent scientists in history, Fred Hoyle among them. And so I think it's uh, very different for experiment. Experiment, we had to retract our results from BICEP too. That's part of the theme of our story. You know, spoiler alert, losing the Nobel Prize. I don't win the Nobel Prize. Uh, and that's because we, <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. We have a lot of confidence for the future. You know, it's so funny, James, because I've been talking a lot with my friend and pen benefactor, Jim Simons, uh, who I had on the podcast. And I asked him one of the questions that you wanted me to ask him about performance and, and hedge fund and the quant business. And so he's been on. And I'm trying to get him back on, and he's agreed to come back on the podcast. But um, but you know what he keeps talking about? He keeps talking about how he deserves the Nobel Prize. And many people, Eric Weinstein and others, do think that he does deserve the Nobel Prize. But this is a guy, I think his net worth is $21 billion, according to Forbes. He's given away almost all of it. But, you know, he's one of the richest people on earth. He's got a yacht. He's got a jet. He's got multiple houses. What is the thing that he is most concerned about. He's most looking forward to winning a Nobel Prize. Now, I know all these Nobel Prize winners, you know, who would, you know, trade anything to have his wealth, right? I mean, they would literally trade their Nobel Prize. Some have, some have sold their Nobel Prize or, you know, I'm not faulting them or whatever, but um, it reminds me when I was learning how to fly, my first plane that I ever, you know, could fly by myself, I remember pulling up next to, it was like a little Cessna, but it was brand new and it was really beautiful and I was renting it and it, it was just so much fun to be at the controls, nobody else in the plane, no flight instructor. And I pulled up and this was in Arizona and I pulled up, it was at um, a Luke Air Force near Luke Air Force Base. And the guy is sitting there in an A-10 Warthog, which is this plane, it's like this bulletproof tank of a plane that shoots missiles and guns. And But like he had to go and like refuel, uh, you know, some other plane or do some reconnaissance, some boring mission that he was going on. And he was like looking at me and he gave me like the shakalaka, you know, kind of wave. And, and I remember thinking like, I'm jealous of him and he's jealous of me. And it made me feel like, because I had this complete freedom. I don't have to listen to some colonel telling me where I should go fly my, this plane. And he didn't own the plane and rent the plane. It was his on loan basically for an, like 40, Five minutes is a typical sortie for one of those. But I go up for five hours and do loops and do whatever I want. They can't do that. Anyway, the point is like Jim Simons, the wealthiest, smartest billionaire ever lived. And he has the most successful hedge fund in the world. It's a very competitive field. And he was a genius to create the most successful one out of, out of those. And yet what keeps him up? He's so interested in physics and math, but he's also interested in what I call the only kosher you know, golden idol, the graven idol that you can worship. I have one made of gelt here for Hanukkah's coming up. Uh, so uh, so I keep that one. That's as close as I'll get. Actually, I got really close to winning uh, to the Nobel Prize recently because I, I gave a, a blurb on the back of a book, um, which is kind of one of these cool things. You ever think like, um, I know you do advertising and you'll have other podcasters on your show, like our friend Jordan Harbinger. He was on your show yesterday or today. Yeah. And, uh, and that's great. And sometimes he'll do ads or whatever. But like podcasting's a zero sum game, right? If I'm listening to the James Altucher show, I can't listen to Brian Keating's Into the Impossible podcast. So you have to make choices unless you listen with one ear. And I think that's a, that's a new idea. You know, can you have binaural uh, podcasting? Jay can figure that out. Getting back to this thing. So you can only listen to one thing at a time. 
And I'm thinking like, um, why is it that with like books? Because you can only read one book at a time. Why do you feel comfortable like endorsing my next book, think like a Nobel Prize winner? Why do you, you know, isn't it a zero sum game? Like if they're reading Brian Keating's book, they're not going to read Skip the Line or whatever. But blurbs is kind of like this, uh, it's the proof that human beings can be generous and work together and not really care about the zero sum nature of things. Um, anyway, that's just a detour. I've been thinking about that lately. Yeah. And there's, there's actually a lot of commentary about blurbs, not, not to get into it, but I would, I would Google what Kurt Vonnegut has said about blurbs because he gave a lot of blurbs. Yeah. It was interesting that, that Tim Ferriss promised that he wasn't going to read any books in 2020 that were new, but he had Jerry Seinfeld on this week. He gives like the perfect Tim Ferriss kind of like, these are my tactics. This is when I do transcendental meditation. I was shocked that he did like Scientology. I, I didn't know that. I knew he did I TM. I knew he did TM. You got to get him the mantra that I've been working on for a long time. And I just can't get it to him. Can I give it to you? And then maybe you'll give it to him? Sure. <laughs> yeah. The, the mantra, this is a killer mantra. The mantra is scrotum. If you just say scrotum, that will just get you over the hump, Jerry. Anyway, getting back to blurbs, I got close to a Nobel because I get a blurb for a woman who wrote a book kind of like my book, uh, but about the Nobel Peace Prize. My book's about the Nobel Prizes in Science, a little bit about the Peace Prize, but she wrote a book about the Peace Prize called Betraying the Nobel. And the foreword, the blurb, is written by Michael Nobel. Uh, as we have talked about, Nobel didn't have any kids, never married. But he'd had uh, nephews, and those nephews had grandkids. And one of them, Michael, wrote the blurb for her book. And my blurb is right underneath. So you're, you're within centimeters of a Nobel. <laughs> Getting back to the uh, LIGO, to the imposter syndrome, to Jim Simons, I think it was it's very fascinating that they feel this way. Uh, for example, the guy that I was talking about, this guy Barry Barish, you know, he's a genius. He's an experimentalist. He's not like Michio Kaku. And what's so interesting about him, I don't know if you remember, James, but in the 90s, there was a plan to build an enormous particle collider in Texas. And it was called the Superconducting Super Collider. It was going to be bigger and better than anything that had ever been built at a cost of $10 billion. And in 1993, under uh, the Clinton administration, Congress canceled the superconducting super collider after they had dug a tunnel that cost a billion dollars. So they had this billion dollar tunnel in Waxahachie, Texas, and they had to fill it in and it cost like two or three billion dollars to cancel, you know, to dig a hole. Only a government could do this, you know, pay a billion dollars to dig a hole, then another two billion to fill it in. <laughs> Right, it's anyway, a perfect bloat. This guy, Barry Barish, professor at Caltech, one of the best scientists, in my opinion, in uh, the last hundred years, he was the head or one of the heads of that project. And he was devastated when that occurred. Now, fast forward, this project had been designed to detect the so-called Higgs boson, which I've had on some of the uh, people that were responsible for it. It turns out there were seven people that invented this concept for what is now known as the Higgs boson, uh, but really should be known by the names of everybody who invented it. Just Higgs had better PR. He actually had a whole PR team working for him in Scotland, or they had it really? working for him. Yeah, so That's he fascinating. Yeah, and and uh, and so my one of my colleagues at or my teachers at Brown University, Jerry Gralnick, he co-invented it. He passed away three years ago, but he used to say, "Yeah, the most important tools to have." Uh, and science are public relations tools. And he really got unfairly excluded from it. And I interviewed another guy, Carl Hagen, not Carl Sagan, but he also invented this. It was a colleague of Jerry Garrell. Anyway. And, and and they won the Nobel for the Higgs Boston, right? No, uh, only Higgs and one other guy won it, but uh, named Englert, but only two people. Remember, they give it to at most three people. Nobody knows why they give it to three, not one, as Alfred Nobel uh, stipulated. He said he could only give it to one. They changed it immediately after he died, gave it to three people. But um, but in this case, I said to Barry, who won the Nobel Prize for LIGO, I said, that was the best thing that ever happened to you. And I've been thinking a lot about this. Uh, and actually, Jerry Seinfeld talked about this on Tim Ferriss' show, because uh, Tim always asked this question, what's your favorite failure? I was joking with some of my guests. I had Noah Kagan on recently. And I said, I've done this Google, you know, you can do like a Google search on terms or phrases, James? <laughs> like an, yeah, like, and you could do one on your name too. Like you can do. I do that. Find out about yourself. Yeah, I only do that. On Most the, people don't do that. I just do that every other day. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, googling yourself, it sounds dirty, but it's not. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I did. Um, so I did like type in the following sentence: like it was the best thing that ever happened to me, and then and then ask what are the two most common words before those words? It was the best thing that ever happened to me. 
And it's basically like, I failed or huh. I got fired. And in my book, I talk about that, how I got fired from this very prestigious position at, at Stanford University. I thought it was the end of my career. My life was over. And I wouldn't be talking to you. I wouldn't have written this book. I wouldn't have devised this experiment. I wouldn't have gotten married. I wouldn't have had kids, you know, at least with the woman that I'm married to currently. <laughs> um, and so it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I said to Barry, I said, I told him, this Nobel Prize winner, if you had not had that superconducting super collider canceled in 1993, you would not have joined the LIGO team and you instead would have detected the Higgs boson. But like the Higgs boson, none of the men and women who built the machine called the Large Hadron Collider, not a single one of the 6,000 people won a share of the Nobel Prize. And even there was a space for them. In other words, there was only two winners of the Nobel Prize that year. And so there could have been a third one and it should have been, in many people's opinion, one of the experimentalists who discovered it. But instead, that there's political infighting, the Nobel Committee. We won't know who was nominated for 50 years. They keep it secret longer than the Warren Committee assassination of JFK file is sealed uh, because it's so controversial, right? Um, but anyway, so I said to Barry, you that was the best thing that happened to you that it got canceled, even though at the time it felt like crap because this is the project you were working on. Little did you know that you would then go to work on a project that would win you a Nobel Prize for the experimental contributions you made. So I asked him, you know, what things seemed impossible. He said, I used to have terrible imposter syndrome. And it was funny because I interrupted him. I said, you know, I just talked to a professor, a world-famous professor named Lenny Susskind. He was actually one of these scientists pictured in the consider a world ruled by scientists. This picture of Lenny Susskind along with Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, but and Richard Dawkins. I'm like, I would not want these people to like be in charge of like taking my kids Definitely to school. <laughs> you know, like let alone like the nuclear suitcase. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I said, um, you know, what, what seemed impossible? possible in your past. And he said, I used to have terrible imposter syndrome. And I said, well, that's funny because I talked to Lenny Susskind this week and he said he had imposter syndrome until age 50 when after he was inducted into the National Academy of Sciences and he was a full tenured professor at Stanford University. He's like, I still felt it. But Barry said, I still feel imposter syndrome to this day. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I went to collect my Nobel Prize in 2017, December 10th, the day Alfred Nobel died. Not the day he was born, the day he died. And I went to is go- Is it always given it's then? It's always given then, yeah. It's, yeah. it's really centered, the Nobel Prize is kind of a death cult in some ways. It's given yeah. on the day Alfred Nobel died. It's from his last will and testament after he got cremated, uh, et cetera. And the, um, they, have, they take these flowers that grow up near his gravesite, his mausoleum in Italy, in San Remo, and they bring them in, and uh, and yeah, and you, you can't win it posthumously. There are all sorts of weird, like death. Related- right. There's all these stories about people who died right, uh, or else they would have gotten the Nobel Prize. Exactly, including Barry. So Barry benefited twice. So originally there were three people who invented LIGO and were most responsible for it, but one guy died, and he died two weeks after the nomination period had closed. Or sorry, he died months after that, but he could have been eligible if the LIGO team, this gravitational wave antenna observatory, if they had announced their discovery two weeks earlier, this other professor, Ron Drever at Caltech, he would have won the Nobel Prize instead of Barry. But Hmm. he died, and they made the announcement too late for him to win it the year that he was last eligible, last living and able to win it. And I pointed out in my book, these waves of gravity had traveled for 1.2 billion years In other words, they had traveled across the universe. If they had arrived two weeks earlier, this other guy would have won the Nobel Prize and my friend Barry would not have won the Nobel Prize. So you talk about Mm -hmm. serendipity. You talk about the fickleness, the capriciousness of life, not just the Nobel Prize. But getting back to this, this particular scientist, Barry Barish, he got up and he, when you go and collect this little uh, medal, uh, you have to also sign this ledger, basically, that testifies that you received it and you, you gave your lecture. There's a couple things you have to do. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize in Literature. And I, I was going to ask you because he didn't show up. He didn't right? show up. So he didn't show up, but they, they made this other uh, arrangement where he was able to sign this book and then, come, and then collect the money. And now it's like, uh, it's chump change to him, right? You heard this week he got six, he sold this catalog for $600 million oh, really? uh, to, a, to a company called Universal, which I approve of as a cosmologist. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so Barry goes, I had to sign this ledger saying I got this medallion, which is, you know, weighs like, you know, 20 ounces or something of gold. <laughs> and, uh, and I also had to, uh, um, you know, uh, look, I, I couldn't resist. I looked through the book and I looked at the past names and I saw 1922, I saw Albert Einstein. 
And he said, I got shivers. And I'm like, I'm still getting like, like tingles. He's like, I'm not worthy of that. I don't belong in the same book. Like his signature. I'm just some Jewish kid from Southern California, you know, originally from Oklahoma, but you know, like who had was shy and like couldn't hack it as an engineer at Berkeley. And so I had to switch into something easier, like like particle physics. And, mm -hmm. and he's just such a humble guy. And I realized it's really rampant. And it doesn't matter if you win it, like, where else are you gonna go after you win the Nobel Prize? I say it's like the ultimate A plus. That's why, you know, my book is about. Uh, making, not making yourself into an idol, but at least recognize it, like check your idols. Like, because if you idolize it and let's say you win it and you've built it up so much, that's why T.S. Eliot called the Nobel Prize a ticket to your own funeral. Because after that, the expectation is like, you're done. You, it's like, here's commencement. You have now graduated summa cum laude, valedictorian. And then like, there's no more grad school. Like, that's it, you're done. <laughs> and so if you don't have this internal and I was thinking about this in the context of listening to Jerry Seinfeld yesterday. I'm like, um, when you're out on stand-up, James, you are a very intelligent person, chess master. Um, you know, you've done millions of businesses, started your successful uh, businessman. You're a wonderful father um, and, and husband to Robin, blah, blah, blah. When you're in these comedy clubs, like I performed once for two minutes before our TEDx talk in 2014. And I felt like the people I was with, they're all drunk. They want me to curse and talk about my menstrual period or whatever they want me to talk about. And I'm like, I don't really like most of these people. Like, you know, and I'm going to joke about being a nerd and they're going to call me a, you know, whatever, call me a schmuck or whatever. And I'm like, but, but Jerry's talking about like just how much it means to be on stage and, and like, but where do you go from there? Like I could see doing a Netflix special because like millions of people will see it. But when you're just doing one of your comedy sets, like you've been doing lately, that's it. The people in the room, that's all who's ever going to see it. Most of them are, you know, but like me, they're degenerate fools. So, like, why do you care about, like, making people that maybe you don't respect so much laugh or something? I, I don't know. I, I always find it kind of seedy. Well, like, any place you have to go and you have to drink a certain amount of alcohol, you know, like, what kind of clientele? Right, because, right because unfortunately, that's the, the business model of those venues. But, but it's a point, like, look at Seinfeld went back to stand-up yeah. after nine years of doing the, the world's greatest TV show. And the reason is, first off, the intellectual capacity to do really good stand-up is, again, it's the hardest skill I've ever had to learn. It's incredibly difficult in Seinfeld's- After learning the, theoretical physics for our podcast series. Yes, exactly. I'm a, a, a PhD in physics on Twitter. Honorary. And, <laughs> right. And, and, and also, there's a huge dopamine rush when you're able to kind of get a crowd to laugh at something you said. And, and, and also, there's just- you, you know, comedians have to look at things in different ways. They have to be the first person in planetary history to take, you know, a toaster and look at it in an unusual way enough to make that it's so unusual that somebody says, oh, I never thought about this before. And then they start laughing. And that's what Seinfeld does very well. He takes the mundane and, and makes it interesting. It makes it unusual. But it how many times wrong. do you need to do that? Like, is it just to get the dopamine hits? I mean, if you- Well, that's the dopamine is related. So, you know, dopamine goes away pretty quickly. It gets absorbed by the body very quickly. So then you need that dopamine rush again. And it's the only way that dopamine rush is larger than just about any other dopamine rush. Mm. And so, yeah, so it's a little different with experiments because, you know, I asked him, well, how do you know when to turn off this experiment? I mean, you've already made this detection. You've already won a Nobel Prize. You know, what, what, where it's the end game. And, you know, in science, a lot of it is, is just, you know, you just keep going and, and you hope that you'll be surprised by whatever comes in next. So I, I found it very interesting that, that multiple of the world's brightest people are coming on and talking about, um, you know, kind of these things that we can all relate to and I feel like, you know, Jerry probably still feels like at some level, look, you will never be able to like do an interview. One of my most challenging interviews is going to be with my PhD advisor. This is a guy, Peter Timby at University of Wisconsin now. He was at Brown when I was getting my PhD. And this guy knew me when I was like the equivalent of, you know, covered in poop in my own diapers, like as a physicist. Like, and now I've kind of gotten to this level where, you know, I want to talk to him as an elder statesman in the field and talk about like what influenced him and why he was such a good fit for me. But, you know, I was thinking about that, like, where do you go? And and that's why I think the the importance of it, as I say in my book, like, 
let's say you win the World Series. Do you know how many people have won the World Series, you know, 50 years in a row? Zero. Like, <laughs> you know, even the team itself dissipates. Like, the Dodgers won it this year. There's very low chance they'll win it again next year. Um, and so, in other words, once you get to your promised land, even if you get to your promised land, how do you maintain contentment in your life when you succeed? Or in my case, when you fail, at least when you fail, you say, oh, I can go back and I can still win the Nobel Prize. But I've kind of gotten to, to think like, a little bit more stoically and Zen-like, you know, what is the Zen? Like for me, it's like in the lab, building this telescope, putting together pieces, like like chopping wood, carrying water. But like for you to get that dope, like you have to be on stage. What's the equivalent of tweaking the lenses in a telescope for a stand-up comic who's, you know, like Jerry just describes, like I wake up every day and I write and I write. I mean, is that it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, for everybody, it's different. You, you kind of have to be, you know, it's an addiction, right? So everybody's uh, like this Barry Barish who has imposter syndrome, he's addicted to, I don't want to say being the smartest guy in the room. Like I'm sure he's not that insecure, but he's addicted to something where, you know, his relevance or his ability to work towards something that um, is going to impress everybody. Uh, you know, he feels like imposter syndrome perhaps because maybe he almost, it, there was a little bit of a luck factor in winning it. And he feels like everyone knows that. And when I say everyone, 12 people know that. And the other <laughs> 6 billion people on the planet think he's the best Nobel prize winner right. in the planet. And, but he's those 12 people who know it, they're important to him. And so he's just addicted to, we're all addicted. We're tribal animals. We're addicted to what people think of us. We're addicted to other people feel I'm an imposter. Do, are we addicted to, is he, you know, everybody wants to do something else. You're jealous of the, the guy who was a professional pilot. He might be jealous of the physicist. Jim Simons is jealous of the Nobel prize winner. Other people are jealous of his money. Maybe Barry is jealous of the theoretical physicist because he feels like, oh, I just made an antenna. Like I'm like a, a plumber and, <laughs> you know, uh, Michio Keiko is actually doing this math and visiting universes in his head and, and, and so on. So I feel like, and even, you know, like on podcasting, like I only look towards the podcasts that have significantly more downloads than mine. I'm like, how come I'm not there? I'm so mediocre. Mm. Like why I, I'm as good as that guy, which is a dangerous way to think because you should never uh, compare and despair. But I, is it, do you think it, maybe it's a characteristic of people who do achieve things mm -hmm. is that there's an element of misery because take stand-up comedy as an example. You can't kill it every single time or else you're not experimenting enough. You're not trying new things enough. You always have to be trying new things to grow in whatever field. And when you're trying new things, it's a natural thing that you're going to do something disappointing sometimes, right. like something not as good. Or if you're playing tennis, you're going to lose some games. Or if you're playing chess, you're always going to play people who are eventually a little better than you and you're going to lose. Right. Maybe when you get to that top pinnacle, you're like, there is no plus one, you know, and so you might, you might start to despair in that sense there is a plus one. Like he looked at Einstein's name and he's like, I'm never going to be, I'm mediocre compared to. Oh yeah. Einstein. I was thinking about, about the field that has slightly fewer cocaine addicts, um, you know, than Nobel prize winners, which is stand up comedy. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're very, you know, we talk all about, <laughs> about intellectual ideas. And... Yes. So that was part one of this episode, but part two is being released today as well. We're not releasing it tomorrow or the next day or the next day. So you, you've already probably downloaded part two. So you could listen to it now or listen to it later. But part two, we discuss a lot more about how to overcome. Often people who are peak performers have very similar characteristics to each other. Some of those characteristics are positive, some are negative. We talk about the positive and the negative and how to maybe even overcome some of the negative aspects of being the best in the world at something, um, you know, the frustration you feel along the way. And we, we both have different theories about this, but also we start our discussion of basically how did, how did the universe begin? And, you know, more on, on Brian failing to win the Nobel prize. What a loser to you can't almost win the Nobel Prize. You either win it or you don't. So anyway, go ahead and listen to, to part two. Enjoy. You've already downloaded it. We're doing an experiment. We're, we're, we uploaded both episodes today. So enjoy. Enjoy. 
These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.